So okay, hi. Uh, we will resume the class from here on this YouTube channel. And a couple of things that I want to say before I jump in Orientalism and the article by Abu Lugot again. Do what Muslim women need saving. So I will post the lectures, upload the lectures here on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And they won't be alive, they won't be synchronous. So I want you to have like regulate your own time and watch them whenever you like. But I want you to comment on them. And I won't be uploading two different lectures for my two sections so the two sections people from the two sections will comment together and you can comment on one another so someone writes something and then you can just write your opinion just like have a conversation on the comment section and normally I will break you up in groups of four or five and I will send you the discussions questions beforehand before the videos but for this week I'm just gonna go over the readings and the points that I want to make and then I will let you know about the discussion groups and discussion questions so before starting again I hope you're all well and if you have any question about uh, overall well-being, if you have any concern, you can communicate to me. And I think Naomi, one of the faculty members, she can um, tell you what to do if you have problems around housing, food. So just tell that to me to send me an email about that. Otherwise, I know times are crazy and we will do our best. I will try to make this easy for you and for me. Uh, right now I'm in Turkey, so this is a good background, my family's library. I'm in South Al isolation for 14 days, but I'm on day 5. And yeah, let's do this. Okay, we have left with the YouTube video, Danger of a Single Story, if you remember. And I wanted you two guys to discuss what is a single story, why is it dangerous, and do you think a blue goat book is a single story or not? And you can answer these questions in the comment sections. I want you to have a conversation around that. And as I had said, this will be one of the questions in the midterm, which will be on March 31st, Tuesday. I will post the questions on March 29th, on Sunday. And I will want you to write two essays, each one page, nothing long. And we won't have a class on Tuesday, March 31st. I will let you write it and you'll send it to me. You will actually post it on Blackboard, but I will let you know about this. So, and Orientalism. Okay, so you have, I wanted you to watch the short videos on Orientalism and it is related, you will see that it's related to the book that we read, also it's related to the article. So, Orientalism is a term coined by Edward Said in 1978 in his book Orientalism. So it's a discourse of representations. We already know what discourse is. So it's discourse is a certain kind of language or behavior specific to a certain domain. In this case, Edward Said discusses that uh, the West has created a certain kind of discourse about the East about how to depict, depict the East. And he looked, at Said looked, at literature, academy, and discourse of everyday life. 
beginning from the 17th century till today, uh, that the West created about the East. So, in these representations, as you have seen in the videos, the East appears as a chaotic, unruly, exotic place. So, we can say that the West has created its own single story about the East, right? And in this story, the East is chaotic, the East is exotic, unruly, as we, we are seeing in the discourse around terrorism, right? Or women appear as sexual, sensual objects for male, male gays. So, in these cases, there is a hierarchy created. The West appears as the rational, reasonal um, part that is able to govern and represent itself. And the East appears as in need to be represented, right? East appears as the place that doesn't have the logic, doesn't have the necessary reason, uh, reason to be able to represent itself. That's what it is. And what does this discourse do? First of all, it legitimizes West's domination over the East. And related to our question in the article, in Abu Lugot's article, Orientalism enables the question for the West to ask do Muslim women need saving? Yeah? So, in this article, Abu Lugot says, There is a rising interest in Muslim women in the West, especially after 9-11. And this coincides with the war in Afghanistan that the US started. And... She is rightfully asking, why do American politicians and media talk about Muslim women only in terms of a rhetoric of saving? He, she, she is saying, and Abu Lugot, we, we know who Abu Lugot is. Abu Lugot is the writer of Veiled Sentiment, that's the book that we read. So, and Rihanna says uh, in her reflection paper, that Abu Lugot argues that the West creates a single story about Muslim women. She says that um, Muslim women in Western media, in most of the forms of media, in newspapers, in articles, in news, in television, they appear as victims and they, don't, they do not have a voice. We just know about them as... Mm, women who are oppressed and as women who are not able to take action against their oppression, right? So, this is a single story as we have discussed, right? This is a stereotypical representation of Muslim women and Abu Lugot problematizes that, yeah? Uh, and she says that this representation actually leg legitimizes the war in Afghanistan that is started after 9-11. So, uh, in the US media, the reason why US needs to start a war or needs to continue the war in Afghanistan is shown as saving Muslim women. And... She says that this, this rising interest in Muslim women, we don't see that towards Christian women, for example. We do not ask, oh, what do, what do Christian women believe? What do Christian women wear, for example? But we ask that again and again for Muslim women. And she's like, why is that so? And she's saying that this question, this rhetoric of saving, first impedes us seeing that U.S. has different interests in Afghanistan. For example, oil, right? Economic interests. Or, actually, uh, but 
just looking at the culture and tradition of Muslim women in Afghanistan prevents us asking other types of questions. For example, what are the economic and political conditions that lead poverty or lack of resources and rights of these women? And veil is treated as the cultural thing that prevents Muslim women's freedom. So there is, a, there is this understanding or there is this belief around the veil that the veil is the sign of Muslim, Muslim women not being free. So they are saying, the US is saying, oh, they should just get rid of their veils so they will be free. Um, but says, but Abu Lugot says, first, this is very culturally biased, as we have been talking. This is ethnocentric. This view is formed through the standpoint that Western people stand. So Abu Lugot is saying, but there are multiple forms of veiling. And women see veiling as a way of being liberated, actually. The, the women who wear the veil, sometimes they see veiling as a form of liberation, liberation. So they do not see it as a form of oppression. So the question is not what we think of other people's choices of wearing the veil, but how the people themselves relate to their forms of living or their choices of cloth, right? So there is a quote on page 31. She says, To put it another way, why was knowing about the culture of the region and particularly its religious beliefs and treatment of women more urgent than exploring the history of the development of repressive regimes in the region and the United States? Such as cultural framing, it seemed to me, prevented the serious exploration of the roots and nature of human suffering in that part of the world. Instead of political and historical explanations, experts were being asked to give religious or cultural ones. So, she's saying that this obsession on culture or religion just impedes us asking the right kinds of questions about the history of the situation. Yeah? Or about how, as I was saying, about how people relate to their own situation. And she's giving examples, yeah? For example, she's giving an example of Hana, a woman, Hana Papanek. Um, so she says that Hana actually sees veil as a liberating invention because it enables women to move out of segregated living spaces while still observing the basic moral requirements of separating and protecting women from unrelated men. So this is this was a quote on page 36. So Hana is saying that she can actually move more freely because she is wearing the veil. Or for example in Iran, women play with the color or tightness, the way that they wear the veil and or how much the veil reveals the shoulder or belly button and these kind of choices actually refers to the political um, or class resistance of women. So veil doesn't have to be necessarily um, I think a, a symbol of oppression neither it or it can refer to many things as political standpoint or class resistance, as in Iran. Okay. So and he's and she's she's doing a comparison uh, between the way that Western people also have specific ways of clothing. Yeah, when they go to a wedding or or an opera 
or to a classroom or just they just go out or they are inside of the house so why um why western women or the why us in general cannot see veil as the way women wants to choose their clothes in middle east yeah but they just put a label on the veil the us is putting a label on the veil and doesn't see that everyone is actually everyone's choices of wearing certain things in certain occasions is actually culturally biased yeah so when we focus on the veil this refers to a uh, previous point that i was talking about we do not see the effects of militarization of women's lives the oil interest the arms in the arm industry and the industrial trade so when we say oh we oh the us needs to go and intervene in afghanistan because they need to save the woman we do not see the ways um actually us interven intervention changes women women's life in various way like like right so there is a militarization of women's lives or us intervention is actually related to the oil interests arm industry or the economy but we do not see or explore those questions because we are asking or we are obsessed by another question and this question is the religion or the behaviors beliefs of muslim women and she ends the article with saying what if freedom for muslim women is different than what the west imagines for them so we are imagining something we are imagining that the freedom for muslim women should mean being without the veil yeah or should mean that they need to step out of patriarchy yeah but she's saying isn't this rhetoric of saving implies superiority arrogance and patronizing maybe we need to focus on uh, creating economic social political conditions available for muslim women to let them decide what is freedom or good for them yeah so if we invest more in how to improve their economic lives for example or how the intervention of us could cease and work in the interest of people in afghanistan not only culturally but economically and politically it is to say what can us do to give more agency to these people for their own lives so if we invest in creating the right conditions or better circumstances for women to be able to come together and decide for their own lives yeah so i think this is all and i yeah i want you to just comment on these i will also send you the I will also send you the slides. So this is an ongoing process. If you have any ideas on how to proceed, I will also I I have activated Blackboard thanks to Victoria. And I will put the readings there and I will put the discussion questions there too for Tuesday. But I I will let you know about all these. So let's try how this works and yeah also for any questions 
or concerns if you want to have an office hours with via Skype or something just send me an email I am free almost every time and yeah I hope this I hope you're all well healthy see you